why I am a Baptist. I remember when Marilyn and I got married, her family were raised as Methodists. And uh, she thought she was a Methodist. And she began to study the Bible, and she began to study church history. And before long, she said, I, I, I want to be a Baptist. Because church history and the Bible had convinced her that the Methodists weren't exactly right. Now we're on page 100, 268 and 69 in John T. Christian's A History of the Baptist. A History of the Baptist, John T. Christian. Now, we've studied about Baptists and their struggle for freedom in America. Even after the American Revolution, there still wasn't religious liberty in America. There were many places where there were state churches. If you were a citizen of that state, you had to pay uh, a tithe to the church, and you had to go to the church or else you would be imprisoned or fined. And the Baptist said, well, the person goes to church or not, or what religion he is, all ministers should be on the same level, and there should be no state churches. And they denounced the marriage of the church and the state. Now, you have to realize that in early America, they thought, you know, that all of Europe was a state church situation. In America, it was a state church situation when they got here. And Baptists had a hard time founding a little colony called Rhode Island, Dr. John Clark and Roger Williams, as they, they worked together there and uh, founding a religiously free colony in America where you could go to church or not go to church or you only supported the church and the ministers that you thought were fit to support. It was not that way in any other colony in America. Now, the war rages on in America for religious freedom. Now this is taking place here in 1779 Go over the war now rising to its height. There were in too much need of funds and to prevent any of the resources to be devoted to any other purpose during the period. And we shall see that when it was attempted, a few years after the expiation of the war, the people set their faces against it. The historians all agree to share the Baptists had to the passing of this measure. The Baptists were in defense they demanded the First and Second Amendments. You can thank especially the First Amendments, freedom of speech and freedom of religion to the Baptist churches in America, the Baptist people that fought the revolution. The other ones were just very well and very happy to just go right ahead and go along with their state churches. They thought that you had to regulate religion or else religion would fall away. Now, Hawk says the Baptists were the principal promoters of this work and in truth aided more than any other denomination to its, to its accomplishment. Mead says they took the lead in dissent and were the chief objects of persecution by the magistrates and the most violent and persevering, persevering afterward in the seeking the downfall of the established church. Talking about the Church of England and the Catholic churches. And remember, all this time people wanted to come to America for religious freedom, but once they got here they wanted religious freedom for themselves only, not for anybody else. The Puritans wanted religious freedom, but when they got here they denied it to anyone else. The uh, Quakers and the Baptists stood for religious liberty in America. Later on the Mennonites did also. Campbell says the Baptists, having suffered persecution under the establishment, were, all, were of all others the most inimical to it and the most active in its subversion, bringing down the state church is what we're talking about. A man by the name of Tucker says in the two following years, the questions of providing for the ministers of religion by the law, by the law, providing for ministers of religion by law, Baptists wanted that cut off, leaving it to individual contributions was renewed. But the advocates of the latter plan were only able to obtain it at the session 
a suspension of those laws would provide a salary for the clergy and the natural progress in favor of liberal sentiments being counterbalanced by the fact that some of the dissenting sects, the exception of the Baptists, satisfied with having been relieved from the tax which they felt to be both unjust and degrading, had no objection to the General Assembly and on this question voted with the friends of the church. But the advocates of the religious freedom finally prevailed after five suspended acts. The law to the support of the clergy were, at the second session of the 1779, unconditionally repealed. The state supported churches for what they wanted, they wanted after the Civil War, or after the Revolutionary War, because that's all they'd ever known. The Baptists were the only ones that ever propagated or uh, wanted religious freedom. This was the best arrangement of the Anglican Church, Randall says. Could now hope for the most of its dissenters. It would seem that the Baptist being said to be the only exception as a church were ready to join the former on this ground and unite with the strenuous effort in favor of the measure. The measures were a state church, a state supported church, a state supported and they, they supported religion by forcing people to go to church. If you didn't go to church, you were fined. You were imprisoned. And before, if you were a Baptist and you didn't want to go to an Anglican church or a Catholic church, you were fined and imprisoned, even though you were going to church. The question, the last proposition of the tottering hierarchy reduced the struggle to one of the pure principles. The particular object of the dissenters being secured, they deserted the voluntary champion of their cause and went over in troops to the advocates of the general assessment. This step, the natural proclivity of the sectarian mind, showed them incapable of religious liberty. Upon an expansive scale, are broader than their own interest as a seismatics. But the defection of the dissenters, painful as it was, only stimulated his desire for total abolition, and it developed more palpably the evidence of the necessity. He remained unshaken at his posts, and brought on the reverse questions at every session from 1776 to 1779 during which time he could only obtain the suspension of the levies from year to year until the session of 1779, when by his unwearied exertions, he's talking about the Catholic Church, the question was carried definitely against a general assessment and the establishment of the Anglican Church was entirely overthrown. The Anglican Church and the England were one and the same. England was a state church a church state. So if we left the Anglican Church in America as it was before, dissenting and, and uh, going against the populace, the will of the populace, we'd still have the Anglican Church or the Church of England here and the England in us also among us. <clears throat> this bill cut the purse strings of the establishment so that the clergy were no longer supported by taxation but they still obtained possession of rich areas and enjoyed the practical monopoly of marriage fees. You didn't get married according to the state in Baptist churches. It was at this session that the legislature, the famous bill of Jefferson on religious freedom was introduced. Jefferson and the Baptist. The bill attracted both favorable and unfavorable notice. It was reported to the House in June 1779 just after Jefferson was elected governor to succeed Patrick Henry, several years elapsed before it became law. A complete victory was not yet won. The period which followed the revolution was favorable to renewal of the establishment upon more liberal basis than formerly, and it came dangerously near passage. State church still. State church still. 
Various petitions were sent up by religious bodies asking for such an establishment. The Baptists alone stood firm against it. The Baptists alone stood firm against it. The Baptists could have had, them, had themselves a state church had been re, and, and been, they could have taxed the people and they could have made the people go to church, but that's not the way God does things. Mm -hmm. The bill establishing the provision of teachers of religion, otherwise known as the General Assessment Bill, was reported to the, to the legislature December the 3rd, 1784 now. The preamble was as follows. Whereas the general diffusion of the Christian religion has a natural tendency to correct the morals of men, restrain their vices, preserve the peace of society, which cannot be effected without competent provision for learned teachers who may be thereby enabled to devote their time and attention to the duty of instructing such citizens as from their circumstances and want of education cannot otherwise attain the use of knowledge. And it is a judge that such provisions may be by the legislature without counteracting the liberal principle thereof adopted and intended to preserve by abolishing all distinctions of preeminence among the different societies and communities of Christians. The bill passed its third reading, but was finally postponed until the fourth Thursday in November 1785. With the Episcopalians, the Presbyterians, and others supporting it, the passage seemed inevitable. The Presbyterian historian remains at the relaxation of the Presbyterians to the measure, and he says, when the bill for a general assessment was brought forward with such an advocate as Patrick Henry, and with the Episcopal Church supporting it, it was generally supposed that it would be certainly become a law to those who had been paying to support their own church and another form to it. The bill proposed relief. They were to pay only for the support of the church of their choice. They were forced to. This was taxation. As it was relief from their former burdens and as the Presbyterian congregations would not be called on to pay more for the support of their own ministries than they would cheerfully give to a voluntary subscription. Mr. Graham was agreed with his brethren to send up a memorial which gives the sentiments on the subject of support of religion, disclaiming all legislative interference under the conviction that the law would be in some form passed, proposed, the least offensive form in which the assessment would be levied. This assessment is taxes, a religious tax in America. Every atheist in America ought to thank the Baptists that they don't have to pay to support a church. Yeah. The Baptists, on the other hand, considered themselves under the necessity of appearing again on the public theater and expressing their dis dis disapprobation of the falling propositioning and using their influence to prevent its passage into law. The Baptists opposed the bill for the following reasons. First, it was contrary to the principles and avowed sentiments of the making provisions for the support of religion by law. That the distinction between civil and ecclesiastical governments ought to be kept up blending them together. That the Christ Jesus was given laws for the government of the, his kingdom and direction of his object su of his subjects and give instructions concerning collections for the various purposes of religion and therefore needs not be legislated by any nation. Secondarily, should a legislated body undertake to pass laws for the government of the church for them to say that what doctrine shall be believed? And what mode of worship shall we perform, and what the sum collected shall be, and what a dreadful precedent it would be if would establish for when such a right is claimed by a legislator and given up for the people by the same rule, they can decide in one instance that they may be in every instance religion, and this is like the press. If government limits the press, 
says this shall be printed and that shall not be printed. Does this remind you of today? In the event, it will destroy the freedom of the press. Baptists stood for the First and Second Amendment. They fought for it. They did not want to ratify the Constitution. And finally, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, talked them into signing it, and they would do the amendments to the Constitution, which they agreed. But still, we don't have freedom of religion in America, and that's still what we're revolution, the, the Revolutionary War is over. The freedom of the press and legislatures overtake to pass laws about religion. Religion loses its form, and Christianity is reduced to a system of worldly policy. <clears throat> Thirdly, it has been believed by us that the almighty power that instituted religion will support his own cause and that in the course of divine providence events will be overruled and the influence of grace on the hearts of the Lord's people will incline them to afford and contribute what is necessary for the support of religion. And therefore there is no need for compulsory measures to make people pay and support the churches. Number four. It would give an opportunity to the party that were numerous and, of course, possessed of the ruling power to use their influence and exercise their art and cunning and multiply signers to their own party and last the least or the most deserving the faithful preacher who in a pointed manner reproved sin bore testimony against every species of vice and, dissip and dissipation and would in all probability have been profited very little by such a law while the men pleasers, the gay and the fashionable, who can wink at the sin and daub the hearers with untempered mortar, saying, Please, peace, peace, when there is no peace, who can lay out his oratory in dealing out smooth things mingled with deception. The wicked, it is clear, would like to have it so. It follows the irreligious and carnal part of the people who richly reward them with their flattery and undeserving go off with a gain. Politics have always been crooked, haven't they? Seems like. The Baptists were fighting for equal opportunity for all religions, not just themselves. And that all men should not be forced religion and the state should be separate. Separation of church and state. And that's why you have separation of the church today because of what these people did back then. The bill was printed, circulated throughout the various counties of the state. A reaction took place among the people upon examination of the provisions of the bill and Madison wrote to Monroe in May 29, 1785 that the adversaries of the assessment began to think the prospect uh, here flattering to their own wishes. The printed bill was excited, great discussion. It excited great discussion and is likely to prove the, the sense of the community to be in favor of the liberty now enjoyed. I have heard of several counties where the representatives have been laid aside for voting for the bill and not a single one where the reverse has happened. The Presbyterian clergy, too, who were in general friends to the scheme, are already in another tone either compelled by the laity of the sect or alarmed by the probability of the further interference of the legislature if they began to dictate matters of religion. So it came to pass on October the 17th, 1785, the bill died in committee. The bill of Jefferson was again introduced in December of 17, 1785 and was passed upon January the 19th, 1786 and signed by the Speaker of the House. Being enacted by the General Assembly that no man shall be compelled to frequent or support any religious worship, place or ministry or whatsoever, nor shall he be enforced, restrained, molested, or, bur or burdened in his body of goods, nor shall otherwise suffer an account of his religious opinions or better, or belief that is, but that all men shall be free to profess and by argument to maintain their opinions in matters of religion and that the 
same shall be in one wise diminish, large, or affect their civil capacities. A man by the name of Bishop Perry decides the attitude of the Baptists and the result of the enmity upon the Episcopalian Church that the most unrelenting opposition to the Church, says Bishop, as an establishment came from the Baptists who in the decade preceding the opening of the war of the revolution had grown from an inconsiderable sect to a body of numerical strength sufficient to make their influence support worth any price when the question of loyalty or revolution was to be settled. They had not been slow to take advantage of the position in which they found themselves at the opening of the war. Remembering the harsh treatment that they had been made it out to them by the royal authorities, their ministers being imprisoned and the disciples buffeted and their chronicles described, it, if they readily embraced the opportunity of weakening the establishment as well as opposing the crown, thus their dislike of the church and the state was gratified in the same time. <clears throat> Conscious that a large part of the clergy influenced by the ties of birth and obligations to their oaths of allegiance had espoused the call to the king, they showed themselves to be inspired by the ardors of a patriotism which according with all their interests were willingly to avail themselves of a fable opportunity to present an advantageous contrast to a part of the church. Consequently, they formally addressed the convention and the delegates to the Virginia legislation which succeeded the last loyal assembly ever convened in the Old Dominion. They accomplished this tender of service with their own petition on way without inter interruption, they that might be permitted to maintain their own ministers separate from others, and they might be married and buried and the like without paying the clergy. Marrying and burying had nothing to do with the church. Marrying and burying had nothing to do with the church, nor the powers of the church, nor of the state. And other denominations, This was the beginning of a series of assaults against the establishment of the church itself, which all the dissenters, with the exception of the Methodists, who had not at the same time formally separated from the Church of England, united with zeal and untiring energy till the end was gained and the establishment was destroyed. You know, the Methodists came out of the, out of the, the Church of England. After this come out of the Church of England right here, 1785. But they hadn't separated themselves from the Church of England yet. They, they were method of study. John and Charles Wesley, Wesley talked to people and brought them to the Bible. And this Methodist was a method of studying the Bible. But they were still part of the Church of England, so they didn't want to any part of this law. The result was such as had been anticipated that those who had strenuously opposed the sect of the act of the legislature deprived of their livings. The clergy, many of them, were politically, if not personally, obnoxious to the majority of their parishioners and found themselves reduced to the necessity of abandoning their calling in the exercise of which they could no longer hope for support. It changed in the whole economy of the state church. Many left, the con many left the country. The sacraments were no longer administered in the parishes, thus abandoned. And although a few faithful priests traveled over large circuits for the purpose of administering baptism and the Holy Communion, they could not supply the lack of constant and regular services and administrations which had been of old. The churches deserted, uncared for, and went rapidly into decay. Often required for public uses and necessities of the state arising from the struggle, then going on, more frequently 
despoiled and des desecrated by the hands of sacrilegious and sordid who coveted and appropriated for their private uses the very materials of the fabric of the church of God. It was every prospect that the church whose officers <coughs> were first celebrated in Virginia soil would be utterly uprooted and destroyed and the gates of hell prevailed against her. The only thing about it is the gates of the Church of England, the gates of hell prevailing against the Church of England, the Lord did not give that promise to them. He didn't give it to the Catholics, not to the Presbyterians, not to the Mormons, not to Islam, but only to the Baptists. You're Peter, but upon this little stone, I'll be building, uh, you're Peter, a little stone, but upon this gigantic foundation stone, me, I shall be building my church, and the gates of hell will not wrestle this church down. The undermining of the safe church was a long process, upheld by the law of the 17th century, says Jennings, Cooper Wise. It was not until a later date, when the state as well as the church had been honeycombed by free thinkers, and the old structure fell, and the masses who had been long supported the religion of the minority asserted that their doctrinal independence as we follow the history of the eastern shore we find the Puritan from New England and the New Netherlands and the Quaker and the Presbyterian East take their turn seeking the shores of the remote peninsula in a resting place where unmolested the new sects might hatch out their doctrines the effect of the people of such process of religious incubation among them cannot be overestimated. And as we take the history of the peninsula in the following century, we shall see how the Baptists and the Methodists also prospered upon these shores. That's the story of religious, the fight for religious liberty. Sometimes uh, Thomas Jefferson was known as a deist and an atheist or whatever. He was a deist. He believed in a creator, but a creator that didn't do miracles. He wrote his own Bible called Jefferson Bible and took out all the miracles of the Old and New Testament. He believed in God. He believed in deity, but not in Jesus Christ. And they said the Baptists had lined up with this horrible person, this horrible reprobate person, to propagate their doctrines. The Baptists wanted religious liberty by, for all. For all. When you preach the truth, you don't need to be supported by the state. When you preach the truth, God, God just absolutely honors that their word will not return unto them void. I hope this class has helped you to some to understand your history, understand how that in the day that we live in today, when it's not freedom of religion, but it's freedom from religion, not freedom of religion, freedom from religion, and now we don't sometimes have the freedom of speech because of that. Baptists bled and died and fought and persevered to give you that right. It wasn't the Methodist, it wasn't the Presbyterians, it wasn't the Church of England, it wasn't the Catholic Church that fought for liberty. The Catholic Church as a whole said that no government could be ruled by the people, that they were not inspired by God, only sovereign rulers. And that America would never be a, 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 a useful country in the world or a legitimate society without a king. We know better than that now, don't we? The whole world wants to come to America, it seems like. They want something here they can't find anyplace else in the world, but it's, it's, it's slowly and quickly and rapidly in some places fading away. America will be like all the rest if we don't stand up again and fight and ask for transparency and everything. Right is not wrong. Wrong is not right. The truth is still truth. Father, I pray that you use this message for your honor and glory. Please touch people's lives with it. Let them know what truth is. 
and what it took and how much it, how much effort it took to give us religious leadership in the First and Second Amendments today. Please forgive me where I fail you. In Jesus' name.